So good morning, everyone. Good morning. That's uh, I know, but it's good morning. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming here so bright and early, at least for some of us. Um, and I want to thank the Fed for putting this uh, session together. And it, it's really, they're doing a, a wonderful job here, and I really appreciate it. And I want to thank our panelists, who um, are also uh, doing incredible work in their own place. Um, my name is Harold Simon, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Housing Institute and publisher of Shelter Force Magazine, a copy of which um, should be on your tables. Um, Shelter Force is a 39-year-old publication that covers the community development field, and, and I'm very happy to say that the particular issue that most of you have was actually one of the inspirations for this event, for this session. So if you all don't have a subscription, get a subscription, that's my plug, and you can also sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. So I, I want to start very briefly by just kind of talking about why we're here. Why is this a topic? And the bottom line is the CDC field has been around for a number of decades, and it's in a kind of transition now. Um, the first CDC that we can recognize as a CDC um, was started in Bed-Stuy, New York, Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation in 67. And probably most of you know that iconic picture of Robert Kennedy walking with Franklin Thomas down the streets of Brooklyn. And, and the idea of that CDC, which grew out of the civil rights movement and grew out of the war on poverty, is that communities need some sort of a catalyst that comes from the ground up. Communities should be able to l make their own destinies. And so this organization was meant to create economic opportunity in the community and by the community. Frank Thomas happened to be the first ED of Bed's Eye Restoration, and in 79 he went to the Ford Foundation. Thomas, along with Mike Sverdoff, developed an urban policy that looked at CDCs as a pivotal organization in community revitalization. And so they started supporting them. They created the local um, Initiative Support Corporation, LISC, and they put a lot of money into these CDCs. And over the 80s, they really grew. But during the 80s and the early 90s, they shifted their focus a little bit. They went from being exclusively community change agents to being, in great measure, housing production organizations. And there are a lot of reasons. Part of it is the categorical funding, there's a whole variety of reasons. Um, and they did some remarkable work. Tens of thousands of, of um, ownership and rental units, millions of square feet of commercial and retail space, thousands of jobs over the years that they were working. But there were still challenges. And then those challenges really came to head with a financial crisis and the mortgage meltdown. In many ways, the CDC community was not prepared for the extent of this. And so today there are questions. Uh, is the model working right? What is a CDC supposed to look like? What's a successful CDC? What is it going to look like to be successful moving in the future? What is its role? Who else is out there? So we're going to try and explore some of these things today. Um, and we're going to do it, as you can tell, a little bit differently. Rather than having three presentations and a few minutes of Q&A, we're going to have a discussion. And after a while, in this discussion, I'm going to ask you to participate. So rather than just asking a question or making a statement and sitting down, I'll come over to you. If you have something to say, and you can certainly just ask a question, but we want to engage with you also. 
I'm sure there are many, many people here who have similar or different, differing experiences that are going to be very valuable for this organization as a whole. They asked me to say a few things. Please speak into the microphone. I just didn't. And I'm fill out your evaluation at the end. The very last few minutes, we're going to do something even different. We're going to spend a few minutes brainstorming, and we're going to cover these questions. Uh, was there anything useful in today's conversation that you're going to be able to take? No, don't, don't, don't ask that question. <laughs> uh, they're so uh, shy. <laughs> Um, anything useful that you can take back to your work? We're always interested in the kind of research that would help practitioners do their work better. So we're just going to find out if there's anything that you need that the Fed and other organizations can research, can provide, that could help you do your work. Um, Immediately after this session, there will be a session on evaluation. How do you measure success or failure in community development? And so we'd like to know in preparation for that, what are some of the evaluation tools that would be useful to you? They say that which gets measured gets done. Well, let's think about that for a few minutes. And this is going to be quick. We're just going to put these things down and it's all being both recorded and um, noted. We're from Shelter Force, so if there are any particular ideas or articles that you'd like to see us cover, throw those out also. Uh, the next session is going to be run by Brad Whitehead. I don't know if he's here. There he is. So if you um, have any questions at the end, go to him and stay. Please stay for the next session. Um, and if you all have any suggestions for Shelter Force, our editor, Miriam Axel, is right over there. Um, I'm going to apologize now in advance because I'm going to interrupt you. And I'm going to do that to move the conversation along. And as a facilitator, I'm imposing um, I'm invoking the interruption rule. That is, as a conversation, and think of it not so much as a, um, a session, but as you know, a bunch of friends hanging out, having beer and pizza a little bit early for the beer, but, and, and discussing these issues. We interrupt each other, but we need to do it respectfully and appropriately. And since I can invoke that rule, I can suspend it also. Um, again, speak in the microphone. Don't forget to fill out your evaluations. So we're really lucky to have three people um, who are doing some of the most interesting work in community development out there. Um, and they work in very different environments. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, describe their organization a little bit, and then I'd like to also ask them to put um, on the table one of the challenges that they see and one of the opportunities they see for CDCs moving forward. And in describing your organization, I'd also like you to talk about the environment that you work in, the general context. So uh, why don't we start alphabetically with Joe? Wow. Joe Kreisberg, president and CEO <laughs> of the Massachusetts Association of CD of Community Development Corporations. Good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you, Harold. Uh, so as Harold said, I run the Mass Association of Community Development Corporations, which is what it sounds like, an association of CDCs. Um, we have 85 members. Uh, a little over half are state-certified CDCs in Massachusetts. There's actually a state law that defines what a CDC is, and there's a process to be certified as a CDC. Um, but in our membership, we also have a variety of other nonprofit organizations that are involved in housing and economic development activities. Uh, we've been around since 1982. We do policy work. We do capacity building, training, technical assistance, 
convening, research, all the usual things from the association, seven staff people, million dollar budget. Uh, and our entire board is comprised of CDCs, so we're very much member controlled. Uh, the context in Massachusetts is varied, because we work in urban, suburban, and rural contexts, and so they can vary quite a bit, but obviously for the purposes of this conference, we work in a lot of older industrial cities, which in Massachusetts have been coined gateway cities. Uh, we struggle a lot, actually, with coming up with a term that we thought evoked a positive image of these cities, but also reflected the challenges, and I didn't come up with it, somebody else did, but it's been a brilliant marketing um, strategy because as soon as uh, this organization coined the term, everybody latched onto it and now we have a very intentional political and policy context in Massachusetts about how do we support our gateway cities and we have a lot of them. Uh, Lawrence, Lowell, Worcester, Springfield, Holyoke, New Bedford, Fall River, Taunton, uh, and there's been more attention in the last 10 years on these cities than ever before. Uh, so that's part of the political context. Um, as you know, it's a pretty progressive state, all things considered, but it has its own sets of dysfunctions as well. And um, what else am I supposed to talk about? What are, just put on the table, oh, challenge one and opportunity. challenge yes. and opportunity for okay. CDC's moving So forward. I think uh, the challenge uh, for CDC's as organizations, uh, there's lots of challenges that all of us in the field face in terms of the world in which we're working. But as organizations, I think the challenge that I see again and again and again is this tension between working in a comprehensive cross-sector way, trying to attack multiple challenges in a neighborhood or a community simultaneously, and the fact that in competing for funding and actually accomplishing specific projects and programs, there is a tremendous advantage to being functionally specialized. Organizations that just do rental housing have a tremendous competitive advantage over organizations that are doing five things. And the same is true in workforce development and in small business development. And so uh, when you look at the funding streams and how those monies are allocated, um, comprehensive work, you know, groups that are place-based and working comprehensively often have a challenge. And, and there's good reasons for those silos and that specialization. The stuff is hard, it's complicated, and you have to work really a long time to get good at it. The more you do it the better you'll get. So and I think that's a tension. One and the opportunity. opportunity is that there's a new recognition or a renewed recognition of the importance of place-based work and comprehensive work. And I think if we're serious about doing comprehensive place-based work, uh, a lot of that has to happen at the neighborhood scale. And that's where we are often working. And you have to have a rooted community-driven organization in the mix. So if we're gonna do place-based comprehensive work, we're going to need something that looks and acts and talks like a CDC, so we may as well have CDCs. <laughs> Great. So Bernie Basic is the president and CEO of the South Carolina Association of Community Development Corporations. <coughs> He's the board chair of the National Alliance of Community Economic Development Associations. Bernie. Thanks, Harold, and uh, thanks to the Federal Reserve for what I consider to be an awesome session, thinking about stealing it and bringing it to my conference. Uh, as Harold indicated, I'm in South Carolina, the South, uh, where the Civil War, to some degree, is still underway. Uh, to the extreme opposite of, of Joe, who's my friend, uh, we're not progressive, <laughs> quite conservative. And so the association, which is 20 years old, so for one, we're a young movement uh, in the community development arena, uh, having uh, started in 1994. And uh, we started with four organizations now. Uh, there's over 70. We uh, look at our work also place-based, but the geographic context is also different because we are a relatively rural state. We have some urban centers, but by no means measure up to the New Jerseys and the Massachusetts. Uh, so a lot of what we have to contend with, uh, we have to deal with in a very comprehensive way. Uh, so our work, and as a matter of fact, my board has uh, just realized that uh, our work um, has been and continues to be very collaborative. So there are a variety of stakeholders that's a part of the association. Now, we do not have a, we have a member, 
uh, and CDC majority on the board. Uh, but we also have dedicated uh, seats on our board for bankers because ironically they were there from the very beginning. Uh, North Carolina did a great job of advocating and beating up on banks so that by the time we came along, uh, banks were ready to work with us. And uh, so we've, our banking partners have been very strong. Uh, we also have other organizations that collaborate with our CDCs. And so now our context, because we have such a conservative policy framework and a policy framework where all power derives from the legislature on down, uh, we have to work comprehensively and collaboratively. Uh, we too have state legislation that certifies CDCs and the state uh, is authorized to appropriate dollars to CDCs and we work with our State Department of Commerce uh, to administer both the certification process and the appropriation process and we also uh, have a tax credit that CDCs can use to attract private investment. <clears throat> So in the framework of, I guess I'd move to opportunities and um, challenges, the opportunity is because of our need to work collaboratively, uh, we've branded the work not so much as community development corporation work, but community economic development. And so we have brought a variety of non-traditional partners into the work. Again, remember we're relatively rural, so some of our strongest allies, both in the legislature and implementation, are conservation groups, agribusiness, tourism, and the like. And they've taken on the mantra of community economic development. The challenges, I think, or the, challenge, the main challenge, I would say, is that our work needs, or our members and our partners need to be able to control the narrative. And what I mean by that is, as community economic development becomes a welcomed body of work by a broad constituency of folk, some of whom are very well healed as far as resources, we are challenged with controlling the narrative, controlling the priorities. And as Harold said, what get measured gets done. We have to define and are working to define what success looks like. And instead of having others define that for us and have that whole body of work be taken away from us. So there's more that we, we're, uh, I'll get into mm -hmm. as we go. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Pat Morrissey is the executive director of Hands Inc. in Orange, New Jersey, which um, is one of the most successful CDCs in the country. And I'm saying that in even though I'm on the board, it's, that has nothing, <laughs> nothing to do with it. And Pat is also one of the founders of Shelter Force Magazine. Uh, Pat? Well, thanks for, uh, Harold, thanks for including me. Um, this is a really important topic. I think that this moment in community development is perhaps one of the, the most crucial. Um, and let me start with let me start with saying what we did and how we got to where we are now, and then I will finish up with why I think it's it's this crucial pivotal moment. Uh, in 1986, I drew together a group of clergy and community leaders, and we looked at the small post-industrial city of Orange, New Jersey, where we were, just next to Newark, and said the neighborhoods are cycling downward, and nobody seems to be doing anything about it. So maybe we should. Not that we knew what we were going to do or how we were going to reverse those powerful forces that were sort of sucking the life out of our small city, um, but we recognized that there was a real vacuum and there was a role to be played by a nonprofit community development corporation. So my context for talking about CDCs is you're in a city, you're in, so you're in an urban place. Um, your territory is either a neighborhood or, in our case, a small city. And that you've decided that you're going to make this place a better place for the folks who live there. And so that's, that's my context. 
When we founded HANDS, we said, we, we said loudly, we don't think that neighborhoods are, are revitalized by nonprofit organizations or government agencies. We think that they improve by the independent actions of hundreds of individuals acting completely independently. And the way in which they perceive the future of that place and the actions that follow are what creates its future, down or up. It has to do with perception, and it has to do with independent actions by hundreds and hundreds of people. Then we asked ourselves, what is our role? So if, that's re if, if people's perceptions and their independent actions are going to change the trajectory of this place, what's our role? Well, we noticed the private sector was sitting on the sideline and wasn't that interested in our real estate market in our neighborhoods. We noticed the public sector didn't seem to be able to get its hands around what needed to be done. So in that, we found our specific role. We defined our role around two sort of core capacities that we, that we wanted to build on and, and develop, and that was strategic real estate and community organizing. We're, we're fond of saying, especially in, in circles like this, that we're the unauthorized leaders of Orange's Renaissance. And then somebody said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, what it means is when the mayor comes into office, he's really glad that you were there keeping an eye on things and helping lead the community when he wasn't in office. And when he leaves office, he's really glad that Hans is there when he's not in charge. It's just that time that he's in office <laughs> that he's a, little, he's a little unsure, right? So that's what it means to be the unauthorized leader. Um, so you want me to go to the challenges and the challenges opportunities? Challenges and opportunities, yeah. Um, I think that the biggest challenge is that currently a lot of people who are concerned about urban revitalization think that perhaps CDCs are irrelevant, that they're not that important to the solution. And in that challenge, every urban place that I've seen, there's a leadership vacuum at one or more levels. And that regardless of whether you have a lot of resources or not many resources, the leadership vacuum is what holds back that community. More resources is better, but strong leadership is essential. And I think that the ch our challenge is to fill that leadership vacuum. I think the opportunity flows directly from that. The opportunity is to find your role within your community, what it needs and how you can fill it, and then <coughs> to be willing to take the risk to exercise the leadership. Great. Um, so now I want to, we'll start with you, Pat. I'd like to ask you very briefly to describe what a successful CDC looks like, you started, um, today, and, and looking into the future. And that's one of the goals of this session, to just try and figure out where the field moves forward. So if you want to define a successful CDC now and in the future, what would that look like? I remember talking to a friend of mine from Providence uh, who knew I had, I had founded a CDC. And the first thing she says is, so I'm supposed to ask you how many units you're doing, right? Um, well, I would start by saying that's not the measure of a successful CDC. Um, unless you think that you're going to solve the affordable housing crisis. How many government subsidized housing units you produce, I'm not sure uh, measures much about your impact, but that'll be our, our next session, our following session about impact. Um, I think the successful CDC is one that says, in order for my neighborhood, my small city to progress, it needs this range of things. And given our capacities, 
this is what we can do best to drive that community forward. And if you can be about that, I think you're successful CDC. So Bernie, I'd like to ask you the same question, but I also uh, want to ask you if that rings true in the context that you're working in and how that plays out. I think it does, uh, but I, I, I think it's important for a successful CDC to be able to be clear on what assets exist in the local context in which they're operating, while also keeping an eye on innovation. One of the concerns I have about the field is we're too wedded to federal and state policy and certain programs uh, for our sustainability. And as you know, from a policy standpoint, uh, friends can come and friends can go. But if we have an eye towards innovation and where the market is moving, and we be relevant in that, then CDCs can be successful. And we can talk about some examples, but I, I would say we have to be looking at technology and where it's headed and what its relevance is in community development and how it applies on the local level. So being clear on what assets and, and being able to identify and interpret those assets and package those assets to participate in a changing market, but also keeping an eye on innovation so that we can transform as society transform. Great. Same question. Both of those things resonate with, uh, with our experience. And we asked ourselves this question when we created the Community Investment Tax Credit Program in Massachusetts because we wanted to have a very intentional effort to build and strengthen the CDC sector, but we had to know what, we what are we building toward. And I think what Patrick said is absolutely right, that at the core, what a CDC is, is the vehicle through which community res residents exercise their own agency in changing the trajectory of the place where they live. And I've, I've talked about this at times in terms of supply and demand side community development. Much of the community development conversation is really on the supply side. What does the government or what does philanthropy decide needs to be done? Finding nonprofits who can deliver uh, that activity, paying them to do it, and that's what happens. And, and, and that kind of is like the government subsidized housing, We'll hire you, build some rental units for us. We'll hire you to deliver a job training program for us. But the government and, the, and, and philanthropy are really deciding what needs to get done. Demand side community development in, in, in the context that I'm talking about it is where the community figures out what it wants to get done. And they then exercise demand on the powers that be and the resource providers to provide the resources to get that done. And I fear that the, the, the system is a little out of whack. The supply and demand always need to be in balance. There's always going to be some tension, some pull and push. But I fear it's too much out of, out of balance. And I think an effective CDC is one that can exercise and implement demand side community development. And that requires. But how do we do that when it's all about scale, when it's all about impact, when it's well, all about, and you know, when we're doing one or two or five or 10 or 20 or 100 units or whatever the outputs are. Yeah. How does that, that's well, what I was talking I, about. I, I understand. So what I, I, think that, I think that's the challenge. And I think part of the way that we respond to that is that in a, so an effective CDC has to be able to do that, which means you have to be able to intermediate between the reality of what the resource providers will provide and the reality of what your community wants and find that balance and that tension, that middle ground. And effective CDCs know how to do that. They know how to work within the public sector, the private sector, and the community groups and find the common ground, find the durable, um, creative solutions that, that, that can be done. And, but to make that happen, you have to have some other skill sets that all effective CDCs are going to need to have in the future. What are those? You have to have a compelling narrative about what you're doing. You have to be able to put your work into some kind of a story that people can understand and that resonates for people. It can't just be a list of things you do. It has to be part of a story. And all stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You have to be able to articulate, this is where we are, this is what we're going to do, and if we do this, this is where we're going to end up, and it's a better place. Do we do that alone? You have to have. Do we do that alone? Just the CDC itself? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> you can see Joe and I just doing this kind of thing. Bernie's playing so, by the rules. So, telling a story is one. Number two, every effective CDC has to have a genuine community base. You know, we say that's what makes us different. It has to be true. And we're holding our CDCs to account on that. Because so we ask them, what makes you special? They say, well, we're community based. We say, well, really? Are you? What's your board look like? What processes do you go through to engage the community? So genuine community base, ability to tell the story, and data. Data is key. You have to be able to fill in your story with data. But data without the story is meaningless. Let's go, let's go back to the, to the supply side model. Um, so here's a dilemma that Hans found itself in. We, we looked at certain neighborhoods in Orange and said, these are the ones that are really cycling down faster. And we committed ourselves to rid those neighborhoods of vacant problem properties. We thought that's, that's got to be the very best role for us. Absolutely. Public sector couldn't get its arms around it. Private sector was just waiting for, I don't know what, you know, going other places. Uh, but they weren't going to dig in in these neighborhoods. So we said, well, OK, let's put our real estate knowledge to this problem and our community organizing. On the real estate side, and this goes to the supply side uh, model, we found that we couldn't access state subsidies for a scattered site acquisition, rehabilitation, and sale model. We couldn't. Well, we could if we could get site control of all the properties <laughs> in, at the same time. in advance. <laughs> you know, so hold on to a whole bunch of slum properties while we waited to apply to the state, right? So, uh, and then the financing was even more difficult. And getting control of the properties, so all these properties had title problems. So we had, we had three separate situations that required systemic change in order for us to fulfill our role, which pretty much, and going back to the narrative, pretty much everybody agreed was the best role for us. In terms of narrative, ridding those neighborhoods of vacant problem properties was the best thing we could do because the neighborhood was full of affordable housing. I don't mean subsidized, mm -hmm. but it was just plain affordable. But not that many people wanted to live there and more people wanted to leave. Um, so what we grappled with mostly at that point was how do we bring about the systemic change? And so we're just, we're a small organization, we're in a small city. Oh, I got an answer for you. And I'm sure well, Bernie's going to agree with me. Well, I, I, I want to start. You have to have but, a state but, association there you go, to work there you go. policy. But, but I also want to know. All effective CDCs have yeah. an effective state association. But you said, yeah. but well, you said I, really, think, I think we do have perhaps the most effective State CDC Association. <laughs> oh, Most of it. Okay. We're going to hold the fights to later. But the sign out said three competing visions. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But, but I want to know when you said that was the narrative, who determined that that was the narrative? Who controlled that narrative? I went to a meeting one night in the East Ward of Orange and I had these renderings of new houses, mm -hmm. right? And I was so excited because we had, we had gotten control of some vacant lots. Nobody had built a new house in this neighborhood in 35 or 40 years. And I showed these, these renderings of the new houses to a group of community leaders who were part of a city hall inspired neighborhood revitalization project. And I got to just kind of like practically a cold, stagnant reception. And Mrs. Naomi Rock, the president of the Elm Street Block Association said to me, you know, Mr. Morrissey, those new houses, they're all well and good. And I'm thinking to myself, they're freaking beautiful. What, <laughs> what's the matter with you, Mrs. Rock? And she says, they're all well and good, but can't you do something about these abandoned houses? And all of a sudden, the meeting came alive. Mm. Every single person at that meeting began talking about, what about 232 New Street? What about 133 Elm Street? What about 86 Ward Street? They knew all the addresses and all the stories of what happened 
in those houses since they've been vacant. Uh, Joe, does that then we, fit your... And then we knew exactly what we needed right. to yeah. do. Yeah. So does that fit your model of community And that based? became the narrative. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it was that the narrative but on up to... I'm going to have to suspend the interruption. ...to control the subsidies and so forth. We tried to make it so. You tried... We tried to make it so. And what level of... And, and I don't want to put you on the spot. Bernie, you're asking that question for a reason. What's the because reason? with South Carolina, when you talk about the control of subsidies and, and so forth, you know, you really have to work hard to control the narrative as to what success looks like so that the policy, so that the priorities, so that where those subsidies go, go where you yeah, want them yeah, to yeah. go. But, but that's that tension that Joe is talking about between being community driven right. and having to work within the confines of the system. And, that, and that's hard and, and I, the reason I pushed Joe a little bit on who's at the table and who's working with this because at least in South Carolina and in the South, we have to work very collaboratively. So in some places, frankly, I can't go and make the case because my voice does not have the kind of resonance. But I have some partners that can articulate the CED uh, story in a way to an audience yeah. that carries weight. So I, 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 yeah, I will, but I just want to make one statement. Um, I'm going to try and keep looking out here now and then, and if someone wants to join the conversation... You have to come up here. <laughs> I will come to you. Um, and, but let's, let's just finish that so, thought. All kidding aside about state associations, you know, I didn't create MACDC. Uh, very visionary people in 1982 created it. The CDCs at the time understood that there were certain things they couldn't do as individual CDCs. They could only do through collective action, so they formed MACDC. And it's no accident that Massachusetts has a strong community development sector relative to most other states. It's because people intentionally <coughs> decided to create such a sector back in the 70s and 80s and build the institutions and the policies. Right. That being said, I think on the housing side in particular, and, and there's a good reason for us to be focused on housing. It has a lot to do with the future of the places where we live, the quality of the housing and who lives there. So it makes sense for us to work on housing. Housing policy at the national level, the affordable housing system, was not designed to address a community development need or vision. It was designed to get as many units built for low and moderate people. It's organized around populations of people and to a certain degree, I think, organized around the needs of the system itself. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. um, but 95% of the units we produce, new units in Massachusetts, are low-income housing tax rated units that are priced for people making incomes between forty dollars and $55,000 a year. Well, that's an important population, and that's a good thing to do, but is that 95% of what we should be doing? Right. Should we be doing some rehab? Should we be doing some home ownership? Should we be doing some housing for people that are poorer than that? Housing for people who make a little bit more? <coughs> if you were designing a housing system whose purpose was to respond to what neighborhoods need to be healthy, diverse, vibrant neighborhoods, we'd have a different looking housing system. Okay, well, I, I want to get back to what it but, looks like. Bernie, and well, then I have someone and, here and who's going to join the conversation. I, I just want to push something here. And my colleagues have elevated housing as the defining, no, uh, no. well, but just so, so, so far, so far, it's larger. And what I want to interject is that, at least from where we're <laughs> dealing with in the South, it's a bit broader. Housing, of course, is an anchor because that's where a lot of the resources are flown. Uh, but there's also the need for real economic infrastructure. And it all depends on the context of where, of where you're operating. And so I just want to put that out there, that, that that's also important. And as CDCs, being the, the main driver of community economic development work, at least what we've tried to push is also the economic infrastructure that needs to be there in order to sustain and to keep the communities affordable and livable for those who so live there. So I'm, I'm going to ask you in a moment what those elements are, and I want to hear your take on it, also the, the non-housing pieces of it. But first, uh, tell us your name, sure. where you're from, and 
to okay, yeah, great. Um, so I'm Walter Wright from Cleveland. I'm at the Cleveland Foundation, but I started it in the CDC world a number of years ago. And it was a little trendy neighborhood, emerging neighborhood in Cleveland called Tremont. And I remember, so we had some, you know, bars and restaurants and artists and developers starting to get interested in the neighborhood, but it was still mostly vacant. And I was over on the western side of the neighborhood meeting with some residents who were opposed to a bar opening there, trendy bar. And I said, so what's the problem here? And they said, we don't want to be like them. And my question was, you don't want to be like who? And they said, you know, Tremont. They call themselves Tremont. All that, all those people coming into the neighborhood. And a light went off. And I was reminded of that story about the <coughs> blind men with the ele elephant. And I realized that my neighborhood had not one constituency, but multiple constituencies. And they all were like the blind men, you know, with the elephant, like this is the tail, this is the nose, an elephant looks like a tree, an elephant looks like a snake. And so I had the younger residents who were moving in, this looked like trendy rental. Older residents, this looked like a cool town home to park their Porsche for a downtown commute. For developers, this looked like money. For restaurants, this looked like a business opportunity with limited parking. <laughs> for existing property owners, this looked like their their opportunity for once in their life to get rich, and they were going to sit on that property forever. And for artists, it was cheap studio space you could buy for less than a used car. For the older residents, no bars, no development, no outsiders. And what's interesting is I just got something this morning where a gallery owner in the next door neighborhood, one of the residents who was the no bars, no restaurants, they just busted a trendy gallery for serving wine to patrons. So the state, uh, state liquor control board came in in their black outfits and busted a bar and it's causing havoc. So there are all these multiple constituencies and I believe in authentic demand um, and visited Lawrence, Massachusetts where that idea was sort of germinated and I think it's amazing. But the difficulty often is you're improving the neighborhood for whom? And which constituency are you going to listen to? I think right. that's a great, great point. And you know, when the community development field of Massachusetts, anyhow, was born, it was born in neighborhoods that were pretty blighted and distressed, like you described, Orange. And so it was easier to find a consensus about what to do. Most everybody is against a vacant, blighted house, and fixing it up is relatively clear. Um, so when we were beginning to have this conversation in Massachusetts, we had always talked about community leadership and power as being sort of the, the, the core value and principle that we were about. But we realized as we were working in more suburban communities and more gentrifying communities, more mixed income communities, that we needed to be clear about two other core values that have to be at the core of everything we do, which is economic opportunity for low and moderate income people. We have to be about lifting people up into the economic mainstream. That has to be a core goal. And number two is inclusion, inclusion of people who have traditionally been excluded. So community leadership and power can be used to be very exclusive. We don't want those people coming in. Uh, that's not community development in our view. So those three core values of community power, inclusion, and economic opportunity, those are, those are bedrock principles for us. So I, I want to ask you about how, what the tools are to enact those principles. But first, so what did you do in Cleveland? Or wherever, Tremont, what is I moved I moved out of the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's still it's still an ongoing issue. I mean that neighborhood has become a trendy place and, 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 and so the the interesting thing and I think the opportunity for those of us from weak market cities is that we don't gentrify rapidly, we gentrify maybe slowly and imperfectly. So existing residents can cash in sometimes and sell houses if they own them. There are opportunities for affordable housing that remain on the borders of some of the trendy areas. We're just sort of fortunate, but there's no real method. And I, I believe now that the real need is to get people joined to the economic opportunity directly, and I don't know how you do that. So if a business opens in the neighborhood, it should employ residents. Uh, if there's a house that's renovated, uh, residents should have some opportunity to benefit from that. And I don't know how we do that um, by building equity. And I think in the old days where people homestead, they had a stake in the community, they could build well slowly over time. I'd love to see how we do that in urban communities, but I, I haven't heard much about it yet. Development tends to be outsiders coming in. Well, one of the two. I actually had a. What's your name and where are you from? Octavia Howell. I'm from the Philadelphia City Planning Commission. Um, I had a related. But different question. Um, you mentioned earlier you that. 
I have to give an answer. I don't have my answer. I was so ready for my question. Go, go. <laughs> she's, and she's in control. She can do that. She's got the money. That's right. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that the way that people perceive a community and the actions that follow are the, the thing that determines it the trajectory of that place. And that's something that I, I say a lot and I think a lot and I believe. And I think the question that I have when you're talking about um, community-driven change and community-driven CDCs is what do you do when you have a place that is not quite at the place that Tremont was where other people are seeing what's good about it, but they're saying, I wish somebody would come here and, and build a bar. How do you get them to see value and how do you organize around, around that to get that process started? Well, that's a real, that, that's that was a, that's a very a, good bar, too. Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's the question about the bar. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> uh, though Hat City Kitchen, when you come to Orange, New Jersey, you have to come and eat and listen to live music at Hat City Kitchen, uh, which is owned by Hans. Um, that's, a, that's a really great question. Is What we look for is what sorts of actions are pivotal to getting people to think that, you know, maybe next, by next year, the neighborhood's going to be better than it is now. And, and we're not talking about, you know, it's not going to be paradise. It's all about the trajectory. You know, it's like unemployment. If, if unemployment is going down, then everybody feels better. The people who have jobs aren't fearing they're, they're going to lay it off. And the people who don't have jobs think they might get hired. Right? So it's all about the trajectory. So if people are perceiving, whatever you can do to get people to begin to perceive that next year is going to be better and maybe the year after that even better, then they start acting differently. All the folks who, who are saying, and you know you've talked to people who said, listen, I'm not going to be here next year. I'm, you know, whatever. You know, I, my cousin has uh, some acreage down south. I'm going to build myself a house, a good life, and all Come that. Come on down. Come yeah. On down. <laughs> um, but, you know, when everybody's leaving, you can't get anything going. You need people thinking. You need the person who owns a house, says to some guy at work, hey, listen, there's a house for sale on my block. It's really a good bargain. And you'd be smart to invest now. People don't say that when they themselves are thinking about leaving. So we decided that the, what was the pivotal activities were those properties, those worst properties, but not just the worst properties. They, the ones that were on a corner, the ones where something dramatic had happened, you know, some squatters were living there, or there was a crack den, or some kids went in and got injured, or, you know, those things that really, you know, ground on people's consciousness about this damn neighborhood, right? We decided that those were pivotal. If we could begin turning those around, then we get the biggest sort of bang for the buck in terms of people feeling, oh, wow. So, so I'm, I'm just going to push uh, 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 forward a little bit, but, but I want to ask. Well, well, I just want to add one, one, one quick institutional, thing. institutionalized process to that, and that is an ongoing, what we call a leadership training program. It's an opportunity for the residents to receive new information and see a different vision. And sometimes it requires within that program to take them out of the community and take them to an area that is similar to what they currently experience, but how it looks when it's transformed. Uh, what we've seen is that sometimes people just have to get out of their own environment and see something different and relate to people that looks like them, that talks like them, that are like them. And so who have made a difference. Who have made a difference, who made that transformation, that, that are now in a community that has a lot of different elements as a part of it. And as a result, they welcome those trendy folk because they add to the overall quality of uh, the community. Uh, Joe and Bernie. So, Joe, I don't want to lose that. How do you operationalize those values? And, and Bernie, um, you described the distinct differences in the South with, you know, a CDC that's working in a neighborhood or a small city. So if you have a CDC that's covering 600 square miles, what does community mean? The kind of, you know, authentic voice of the community that Joe is talking about. That is community. <laughs> it, I, it, I mean, community is defined differently. Yeah, yeah, but, but how, how is it defined there? 
It, it is defined based on the cultural context. Uh, it's defined on the way of life. Uh, it's defined on the, the transportation system, uh, how folk get from point A to point B, how they relate to each other. So the geography does not matter. It's the, the cultural context in which they operate. So there is a clear community definition for a CDC that's operating in three and four counties. And they are, the, they, they are very similar, distinct attributes that they can recognize this is our community. So Joe, I love, thank you, I love the values, but how do you put them into operation? Well, first of all, I don't mean to suggest that because we have a clear sense of what our values are that it makes every decision easy, and that those values don't run into conflict with one another. They do all the time. It's really hard what we're trying to do. And it's even hard sometimes to find exactly what our goals are, especially you know some of the issues that you raised about neighborhoods. And so I think it's mainly through conversation and through reflection and by uh, making sure that all the different voices are at the table. And part of what makes place-based work particularly hard is you can't just sort of sit in your corner and shout and throw rocks. You have to reconcile the, those competing so, views and visions. So how do you make sure the right people are at the table, and especially given that you, you know the drivers of this all too often are funders or specific policies? Well, wait, wait a minute, which table? The one he just mentioned. And it, within a community. Okay. Well, I think, I think that, you know, uh, Bernie was talking about collaboration and partnerships. I mean, certainly CDCs can't do it themselves. You know, maybe they have 15 members of the board, maybe they have, you know, 500 members. But there are organized institutions within any geography that need to be brought together. And you need to be very intentional to make sure it's not always the same old, same old. Uh, again, not easy. The same old, same old are, are, are powerful for a reason. Their voices are heard for a reason. Um, but a number of our members, and I know a number of organizations around the country, have just taken it upon themselves to be much more explicit and intentional about reaching out to new constituencies, both organized voices and the non-organized voices, whether it's door knocking, house parties, community meetings. Um, but obviously, at a certain point, you have to make some decisions. You have to reconcile the, the constraints that you operate under. And I think one thing you have to do is, is, is not, is, is manage that tension of raising false expectations and sort of suggesting that we're going to be able to solve everybody's problem. And then people get frustrated and burned out and don't want to participate anymore. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to pick up on the comment here, just. I do sometimes worry that in order to attract funding, you have to sort of convince people that you're, the place where you're working is so terrible, and so needy, uh, because a lot of that helps you get funding. And that can become self-fulfilling. It's why I find the whole opportunity mapping thing so uh, counterproductive, because you know to have respected voices declaring vast parts of our country as terrible places to live you know, becomes self-fulfilling. And, and yet you don't want to be Pollyannish and pretend that there aren't any problems. So finding the right way to describe the places, that's what we like the Gateway City term, we feel like it sort of walked that line well. But, and I think the same thing is true for our field. If we keep asking sort of what's the future of CDCs and are, is there a future for CDCs, it sort of becomes self-fulfilling that there's this negative perception. I mean, the, I think CDCs are doing incredibly innovative and exciting and challenging work, and yet somehow there's this narrative out there in the country that CDCs are yesterday's news and we need a whole new breed of social entrepreneurs and impact investors and <laughs> all this other stuff. It's like, that's what we've been doing, and, and so many of them are doing it terrific. So um, I worry about these self-fulfilling narratives. What's your name and where are you from? And okay, my name is Donna Brooks. I'm from I'm the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, but my what I'm here for is on the grassroots level because I'm also involved in the community out in the neighborhood. And I'm going to do the Jeopardy thing. I'm going to do the answer and then go into the question. <laughs> okay, the answer is we had three neighborhoods dwindling CDBG funds. They almost all three went under. So the answer was we joined the three together and it's now one CDC. And trust me, we went kicking and screaming and, and we still keep the three neighborhoods separate and it's been an adventure. So my question is, have you seen this model before? Has it worked? Has it not worked? And I don't want to lose one thing. Um, a second thing is you talk about those who've made a difference and, and the people that are working. What methods do you have you seen to recruit new people? 
because having been involved in the community for over 30 years of my life now, I'm getting a little tired. And a lot of the people I work with are getting a little tired because it's the same people at the table over and over. Great. Pat, you want to take that second part about recruiting new people? Yeah, um, sure. Um, recruitment's difficult. Um, it's, recruitment is very, very intentional. This is what I found. Recruitment is intentional. Not every person who's fired up should be recruited or, or should be, you know, <laughs> brought, brought into a, um, a position of responsibility or authority. Um, it's, you know, if, um, if you read the work of, uh, of um, Ernesto Cortez, Ernie Cortez, um, there's, there's a wonderful book called Cold Anger, and it really talks a lot about recruiting and what it takes to get to know a person, to get in relationship with a person, and then when you find the right person to keep moving forward with them. Um, but it's very difficult, but it's very, very, it's really a job, you know, and an important one, because you're, you're, build, you're building something. And, and I would say on the recruitment angle also, uh, and I, this is our experience in South Carolina, we have some young people coming out of the uh, universities that may have gone or, or started their studies in a field like environment or in law, but realizing as they've gotten close to the end of their, their studies, that's not really where they, they want to spend their life, but they want to use the skills they have. And they're finding community development as that way of connecting their values with their skills now. And we found it as, I mean, it's not overwhelming, but to your point of being very clear in interviewing and, and, and uh, working at, at mm -hmm. whether who's the right fit, we're finding some awesome young people coming into the work. Yeah, we have to. And on the merger, it's, we've seen it, it, it is a process. It's not something that uh, clicks overnight. And it's something that's going to happen. It's good that you set, kept the neighborhoods separate, but you have to really pay attention to uh, the details of voice from each of those communities, but helping them to understand they have a common vision. So, so we have about 10 minutes or so to continue the conversation. And 20 questions, so. Yeah, oh, well, you know, that's how it works, that's okay. Um, and then we're gonna take a few minutes to brainstorm those questions that I'd ask in the beginning. So, just briefly. Hi, my name is Chris Ryan. I'm the director of a CDC in Baltimore, Maryland, called the Southeast Community Development Corporation. It's been around since the 70s, and I think we were an early recipient of a Frank Thomas grant from the Ford Foundation. Um, I'd like to ask a different question, because I, I don't think that things are radically changing now. I agree with Joe. This is the issue of of some sort of new strategic direction, I think, for CDCs is a false issue. Um, I don't think things have changed that much, nor will change. The types of communities we work in um, are not going away in the United States. Um, in fact, there are a number of trends uh, with the decline of the middle class that make things even more challenging in the future. The question I want to bring up is, um, listening to Pat, um, first of all, I want to compliment you on how you've articulated the role of CDCs. The structural real estate community organizing role is certainly a bedrock of what we do. Uh, the need for a compelling narrative, a genuine community base, and the use of data is, is totally what we do in and out every day. Uh, and I hope people think we're an effective organization. But this, this idea of attracting wealth to a disinvested um, community like you're doing in New Jersey is is sort of our bread and butter every day. Uh, and yet, as uh, the longer I'm in this business, um, some of the issues that Bernie brings up um, keep coming up more and more in, in our work. And that is, once you do attract wealth into a neighborhood, you attract a, a type of person with wealth 
to invest in a disinvested community. Um, how do you build household wealth within that community? So I think the idea of um, maybe building uh, tax credit housing, which we all did for 10 or 15 years, might have gotten this off track. That might be the real issue. Um, and we got away from developing household wealth, which I think in a, in a rural, low-income community is probably your biggest struggle. And so my question is, have you heard of models um, around the country that were not about attracting wealth back into a disinvested area, but about building wealth within a low-income area as well as attracting wealth? Well, the, the tool, and you all know about it, the tool that we have used most successfully is the IDA program in the development account program. Uh, folk are clamoring for participation in that uh, because it is, it, it recognizes where people are, there's value and there's opportunity. And it disciplines them to say, okay, this is, this is a goal that I have, this is uh, an asset that I want to acquire or I want to build upon. And then, of course, it attracts the match funding, but it also now is attracting investment from bankers and from other um, institutions. And, and so that's the tool that we've used and has been very successful. And one of the interesting things I found out is, you know, we recognize three assets, uh, buying their first house, starting a small business, or getting their, further in their education. The largest use for the IDA program is starting a small business. And because the way our state economic development leaders think is in order to create wealth and community, we must attract industry, smokestack chase. That's the only way we're going to create jobs. And so 99% of the state's uh, energy is focused on that. While there's so much opportunity to invest in the individuals that are there, their ideas, their visions, their dreams. How do you do that? Well, we. The IDA program gives us the mechanism to do that, and then what we attempt to do is to tell the story of those successes so that a broader array of investors can also invest. And there's now an emerging, and it may not be emerging in your areas, but in South Carolina it is, social venture partnerships, social venture investors. They're looking for places to make investment and also make an impact for are, their are, are those the ones that are driving the agenda? Well, they've just come on the scene, so we're in that we're in that that, that dating period <laughs> to make sure that, that that we can coexist and you you respect what we're what we're saying as we come along. Great. Um, no, go ahead, talk. Well. I just, I, I, we don't have a whole lot of time. There's a couple of other, there's the one key opportunity or two key opportunities that I wanted to just make sure we got out. So one is that there's growing research and data to show how important community development is to other social outcomes that the public cares about. Health, education, public safety, probably the three biggest. And I think that's a huge opportunity. And the more that that sort of academic and scholarly research becomes part of common knowledge, the more I think we can use that to generate resources for the core work we do. There's complicated ways to do it, and there's simple ways to do it, but it's a huge opportunity. And, and just by being more explicit and intentional about it, I think we can attract a lot more resources. The second thing is that the way this conversation all gets framed is sort of in a prediction mode. Like, what is the future of CDCs? We're trying to guess or predict what might happen. But I'm not really that interested in guessing or predicting. The whole community development field has been about changing the future. It's seeing a trajectory you don't like and changing the trajectory. So the, really the conversation, I think, needs to be more about how do we, what do we want the future to be, and then how do we go get that? And, and it, again, it goes to my core point. Community development corporations don't operate in a vacuum. They operate within a system, within an ecosystem of actors and players. And I'm just making, I'm just asserting that they need to be part of that system. They're not the system. They're not the whole system. They may even be 15% of the system, right. but they're a critical piece of the ecosystem. So if we want them there, as Living Cities has pointed out, you can't have investment capital if there's no one to invest in. And, and there's no local capacity. So we have to be intentional about that. 
there were a number of really visionary people 40 years ago who were very intentional. We see this model, we like it, we want to build it for the future. And we've been sort of riding on the wave of that intentional capacity building effort for 30 years, and it's starting to run out of gas. Well, no kidding, it's running out of gas. So that's why in Massachusetts, and I think in other states as well, we began seven, eight years ago before the crisis, and we weathered the crisis far better than most nonprofits, I think, to say, what is the future we want and how do we build it? And we've been building slowly but surely the infrastructure, the modern infrastructure that the field needs to be successful in the 21st century. So I just would encourage us as we think and have this conversation, what is it we want, and then let's go get it. Now let's just wait and see what happens to us and then deal with it. Thank you. Um, my name is Francisca Richter. I'm at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, but I'm kind of inspired by what I hear uh, uh, to think back of the work that my mom does um, with her, her organization in Peru, where they build these grassroots pharmacies throughout the country in rural places. And so, um, and also by the work of a colleague who uh, goes back to support um, uh, the uh, availability of good water in, in Haiti and also see in there that whatever uh, was successful was the, uh, the integrated work of the community in it. So even charging the community a little bit for water uh, prompted them to get involved and that kept those water wells uh, operating. And so, um, so now p thinking about community development here, um, how, how limited are you by the funding streams and what the you know the, the federal programs that support you to maybe go into turning one of those vacant properties or a group of vacant properties into a recreation center parks um, or working for um, after school programming for children where that perception will change because the kids are working on a park on an urban garden or things like that so I, I don't want to be too idealistic. I know you are limited, and I want to learn about, you know, what what would prevent you from doing that. Thanks. Well, not not a hard question for 90 seconds. <laughs> we would excuse a person for being too idealistic if her mother is opening up pharmacies throughout <laughs> four villages in Peru. So just to start there, um, we have found we have found that the places that seem to give the most hope are within the properties that we've um, acquired and rehabilitated and then have become like a, a young artist center uh, or a cafe or a gallery for disabled artists. Um, those are places where hope grow and, and those folks who are part of that, they start becoming community developers. I remember when the, when the teenagers at our Emerging Artist Center um, were posting up signs, orange is cool. <laughs> and it was like, it was such a turning point because they all thought orange was a dump, right? And just couldn't wait to get out of it. Now all of a sudden they were the messengers of orange is cool. So I think those are great little, you know, places where hope grows. Did you want? Well, one, we've had an experience with one of our CDCs that created a youth entrepreneurship center. Uh, and the reason that is so transformative is as those organizers decided to work in a particular community, uh, they bought into the notion of find out what the community values most. And for that community, it wasn't the housing, at least at that point. It wasn't the businesses, it was their children. So they started 10 years ago with a youth leadership program that now has transformed into a youth entrepreneurship center that they took a space renovated it, and now they have, again, those social investors investing in. So it's a recreational center, it's a volunteer center, and it's a place where those young people are, are uh, creating enterprise for themselves. Hi, I'm Lynn Martin Haskin with the Philadelphia Association of CDCs. Welcome to all of you who are not from Philadelphia. I hope you're enjoying your stay here. Um, the uh, Philadelphia Association of CDCs has, has done much, gotten its ducks in a row. We've reached out, we've created a national advisory board. Some of the members are here, Joe, Teresa Singleton, I saw Dr. Bernard Anderson, the Senior Vice President of our tax credit partner, Wells Fargo, and I'm sure I've forgotten someone I didn't see. But my question is this, Bernie, to your point. 
um, you said that sometimes people have to say the things that you may not be able to say. So you're very much talking about collaborations and coordination uh, and so forth. Without naming names, and I don't know those in your community, but could you describe who has been your most useful new person or partner, who or what institution, or what non-traditional person or partner or corporation have been particularly helpful to you? As, and others may answer as well, but sure. I thought Bernie really spoke to that. Sure. Well, we are a Republican-led state, both houses in the governor's office, and uh, we have been able to attract some very strong Republican voices to carry the water for us. I can sit in my office while the budget is being, when the governor vetoed it, our vetoed our funding, and I can sit in my office and watch the, the, the live stream while one of our Republican senators stand up and say, we are gonna override her veto because this is important. So uh, allies that are on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, one of the most interesting groups that we used to kind of combat and fight with are the conservationists. Um, and they now articulate CED just as clearly as I can. And they go into those places, and they have some deep pockets that they can access. And, and they actually can speak to uh, donors as well as uh, policymakers and uh, stakeholders in some places that I can. And they're directing them to us. Just got an email from someone else saying, I need to talk to you about a new funder who wants to do that. Agribusiness and tourism has also been players that have been articulating uh, the work for us. So again, because our context is so different, uh, we've had to engage a variety of stakeholders. And in a lot of places, they've legitimized. Not that the work is not valuable, but some people interpret it differently. And they've helped to legitimize this and say, yes, CED is important. These CDCs and CDFIs are awesome. Just, I'd like to answer that as well, because when we were pursuing the Community Investment Tax Credit, which is a new 50% uh, donation tax credit exclusively for CDCs that will generate $12 million a year starting next year, $6 million this year, $12 million next year, and flexible funding for comprehensive place-based work, uh, which nobody ever thought could pass except us. But when we had the hearing on the legislation, we were very intentional about who testified in favor of it. And we had a school superintendent from an inner city school district who'd done research on the connection between housing instability and educational attainment. We had the head of the largest environmental organization in the region because we had cultivated a relationship doing energy efficiency and lead paint work and other things like that. We had two uniform cops, too. We had, we had a public health, we had a community health center uh, person testifying. We had the United Way testifying. So, and we had cultivated those relations over a long time and relationships are a two-way street. We worked with them on their agenda too. And when the push came to shove and our Democratic governor was thinking about vetoing our bill, we got calls in from the chamber and the AFL-CIO because we had relationships. And, and, and it really is important to emphasize that relationships are key, they take time, and they're two-way. Right, now, we have a couple more things to get to, but is everything clear now? <laughs> As mud. We know what the next steps are. Good. Um, so now I'm gonna just quickly run over to you all. Uh, was there anything that you heard today in this conversation that you think you can use in your own work? Thank God for raising your hand. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, uh, the simple statement, identify what assets exist, not just, for example, within our organization, but in each community, in each, every corner of, of the city. And then the phrase gateway cities, perhaps both marketing initiatives or concepts, but uh, positive nonetheless. Great. Raise your hands high. Gateway cities. I really no, like you need a microphone. They'll get so mad at me if I don't make you take it. 
I think the concept of uh, creating momentum and a trajectory, starting somewhere and building from there so there's a sense that your community is going forward. I'm sure you are going to take a lot with you, but you have to think about it a bit. Anyone else? Yep. So I get to talk twice. No, I learned so great terminology, strategic real estate, investment. That can be the direct investment, or we do a lot of program work, community organizing. This, the whole supply-demand balance is a great concept that we should always keep in our, in our work. The, um, the ethics of inclusiveness, I think nobody talks about that, but it motivates us very highly. There are deals we won't do because of those kinds of ethics. Um, and certainly the, the balance of a, of a good story with data and, and always the thing of what's a legitimate uh, community base. Those are all uh, ongoing issues, always have been, always will be in this line of work. And I think you crystallized them very well. Thank you. Ramona Johnson with NeighborWorks America. Um, I also learned, too, the importance of partnerships and collaborations, um, especially in the field of education, um, which I think is critical in the work that we do in community development, because we know the importance of the schools, and I'm so happy that we're having a session during lunch, um, but the importance of educating our youth um, through elementary up to high school and then certainly to further their education. Because the more um, educated folks are in the community, um, the stronger that community certainly will become. Um, and also the ability to tell the story and to fill in those blanks. You know, what is the story? How effective has this work um, that we all do um, really has changed the community in which um, we live? Um, and then the there was one other piece um, but I actually can't read my handwriting. Um, but certainly those three top issues, again, education, health, and public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go real fast. Okay. All right, real quickly, um, I, what really struck out at me was um, I'm part of the Strawberry Mansion Community Development Corporation. And we're a small CDC, but growing with growing needs in our neighborhood. And when I get with the big wig CDCs, one of the first things they always throw out is, oh, we did so-and-so units of affordable housing. So I like the fact that you were talking about you can't measure your success as a CDC just by the number of units that you produce. That's like, I think a lot of people need to really take that into consideration and kind of reevaluate some of the things that other things and other needs of their neighborhood. And I also, um, one of our taglines is also a neighborhood that is not have, doesn't have a plan will be planned for. So it's really critical that you always ask what does your neighborhood need to be successful and then how is your organization going to go about helping those things happen? So I appreciate those conversations. Okay, she took what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm Stacey Berger from the Housing Community Development Network of New Jersey, which, you know, there's some risks and rewards evidently about being a statewide association of CDCs. Um, but I guess one of the things that Joe said that I, I just found really fascinating was the Gateway Cities. You know, we, we talk a lot in New Jersey about first ring suburbs, and that's really um, not a very sexy term. Um, or older, I mean, even older industrial cities is, it, it just, it doesn't talk about the future, and I think that that's the key piece that links up for the other part of what Joe said, and I don't mean to leave Bernie or Pat out, because I think oh, yeah. you all had also very, very um, informative and thought-provoking things to say. Harold's tapping me, so um, <laughs> I guess what I, what, I was, what I wanted to get at was the idea that, that CDCs need to brand what they want to be and what they want the communities to be for the future so that we're the ones, or our members, are, do, are the ones who are leading and making sure that the vision is there for tomorrow and not just saying this is where we are today, but well, here's where we want to be tomorrow. I expect to see a few workshops at the next meeting on that, right? There you go. Okay, now, hold on. We're, we're running out of time, so I want to get to some of these other questions. Um, Federal Reserve does research. Is there anything, again, 
in, as the discussion that the kind of research that you might want them to do or other organizations that would help whether it's telling the story, getting that data that Joe was talking about, anything at all. And we're down to the last couple of minutes, so. Uh, Terry Gever from Achievability at Philadelphia FDF. Uh, one of the things that I would love if, and we've talked at the, about this at pay FDF meetings, if I would love for some of the data to be at the neighborhood level, because most of the data is at the city or county level, and if we want to see like more like official data as opposed to getting stuff from Zillow or Trulia, uh, it would be great if the Fed could break it down. Thank you. Hi, you'll hear about this at the next session, but I think I'll give it a little shout out. NeighborWorks has success measures, and what it did for APM Association Puerto the in March, it actually was able, we were able to go out with Temple University and our community connectors and survey over 700 people and we really found out what they thought of the work that we had done over the past 43 years in the community between community development and social services. Uh, so, and also a shout out for comprehensive planning to the Wells Fargo Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Now that's a great segue to the next question. <laughs> uh, if I can only remember it. Um, <laughs> seriously, I have to look at it. What's my next question? Oh, that which gets measured gets done. What are some tools you could use to measure your work so that, you know, you can get it done? Someone new? Well, think about it and stay for the session and tell Brad. So uh, when I was looking at CDCs a couple of years ago, we looked at a metric that I thought was interesting. You know, with the housing crisis, some CDCs were really relieved that we were no longer counting units because they hadn't produced any. <laughs> um, and, and that's not a dig, but that's just the truth. But we looked at CDCs and we looked at their finances and we looked at those who were hanging on to a lot of money and not spending it. And we looked at those that were hemorrhaging money and in danger of collapse. And we tried to find, uh, oops, dead. We tried to find the CDCs that had the appropriate amount of funding that they were investing in the community and yet being conservative to save enough to survive. Okay, so, hold on. Um, if anyone has article ideas, see Miriam, she's right over there. And I think we've just about run out of time. Um, I think that there were, a, even though there are very different approaches in very different contexts, there really were a lot of similarities around the core values, the approaches, how you engage people, how you tell your story, how you inspire people. And, and that's, that's really great to hear. And, and I'm also glad to hear that there is no one size fits all. That context drives so many things. And so I think this is a great discussion. I hope the folks out there agree. And I want to give you guys a big round of applause.